OK, it's 2 o'clock. I guess we start the afternoon sessions. So we're from CERN. I'm Dan. And this is Teo. He's working with us on Ceph operations. So the talk today is basically a summary of the Ceph operations at CERN. Um, where do we go from here? I mean, how do we come up with names for slides? That's the, <laughs> that's the point there. The picture there is a, is a proposed co collision of particles from the new um, the new, much larger uh, particle accelerator that's planned for, for CERN. That's the, one of the promotional pictures. It looks nice for, for a slide. So just again to, to introduce, I'm, I'm Dan. I've been operating Ceph since 2013. And I'm fortunate now to be on the Ceph governing board representing the scientific and academic users. And um, yeah, yeah. And this Teo, he's been joining yeah, us. Yeah, I'm Teo. I'm uh, working uh, along with Dan, and uh, we do together operations at uh, CERN for Ceph. Yeah. So we're in the storage group in the CERN IT department. It seems everyone's reminiscing today. So <laughs> by chance, we're also reminiscing a bit, going back to the very origins of Ceph at, at our institute. Um, it was in February 2013 that we first wrote this kind of proposal. Uh, OpenStack was becoming popular. and as is kind of common at CERN, like they forgot about the, the data part, the storage part for our cloud. So they said, hey, gee, can you guys do something for data? And then Google around, and you find Ceph is the obvious one. And that's how it kind of started. Um, this was our first Ceph cluster. It's still in production. Um, it was during the, the dumpling days. It was uh, each of these servers is a JBOD with some SSDs. Actually, we didn't have SSDs at the beginning, and we had to like prove that SSD journals was, was interesting. And this was all, all of the, the fun days when we were learning how Ceph was working. Um, this one's still in production. Um, so we started with a 300 terabytes proof of concept. Then we had three petabytes in production that fall. Um, over the next couple of years, things were growing, and we were involved in the erasure coding development. Um, and also, like for physics data use cases, we noticed that Rados, we wanted to use the low-level Rados protocol for some physics data storage, but it was, um, it was not appropriate because the objects can be too large, so you want to stripe them into smaller pieces. So this is why we wrote this Rados striper library that people have maybe seen. Um, in 2016, we upgraded one of our big clusters, uh, replacing all the hardware, that three petabytes that I showed, migrating all the data to another cluster with with uh, twice the space, with no downtime. So this was the first time that we could actually try this, uh, this idea that, that Ceph is like a kind of organic, uh, always living data cluster that, you can, that can survive through multiple generations of hardware. Uh, then we had, by then, eight Ceph clusters in production, which is now not even a big number, right? Um, used to be impressive. Um, then we, last year, we, we had the decision to actually make S3 and CephFS also production status for our, for our kind of business use cases, uh, typical filer stuff, or also like so many IT applications now just expect S3. You know, if you, you're not really an IT department if you don't have an S3, S3 service now. Um, and then this year, we've been looking more at CephFS for HPC, for real like typical HPC um, like MPI clusters and optimizing CephFS in that use case to try to kind of get into the business where you would typically find uh, Lustre and things like that now. Um, this is our clusters that we have today. Um, the biggest use cases are still for OpenStack, Cinder, and Glance. We have uh, six petabytes in, in Geneva in our main data center, uh, one and a half petabytes in a remote data center um, in Budapest that's actually being decommissioned this year, so we'll migrate all this data back. And then we have a small um, hyperconverged cluster. Uh, CephFS, we have three clusters. Um, again, like one petabyte for Manila, for OpenStack Manila, and like just like bog standard NAS use cases. Um, we have a small test cluster because everyone should have a test cluster. And uh, again, hyperconverged cluster. So we, our hyperconverged CephFS is actually like it's an OpenStack cloud cell with block storage and CephFS there all in the same nodes all flash, uh, for, for, and we'll get more into that in the, later in the talk. Um, we have a five petabyte uh, cluster, which is a buffer in front of our tape system. So users writing, writing files to our tape or recalling from tape goes through this disk buffer. Uh, and then, yeah, we have a two petabyte S3 plus Swift. And right now, we're running all Luminous or Mimic. We're just starting the Mimic upgrades. And now, after hearing the exciting news about Nautilus, we'll probably maybe next week go to Nautilus. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. Um, 
the rest of the talk is going to be like outlining our recent notable ops experiences, like migrations and upmap stuff and some S3 authentication. Teo will explain that part. I will explain some of our, highlight some of our interesting use cases. Um, and, then, and then Teo will explain some interesting thing he's doing uh, with a new Ceph contribution. So, go ahead. Yeah. Hello, I'm Teo. I'm going to talk to you about uh, our recent operations experience that we did this year. Uh, in early 2019, we had three act active clusters on uh, file store. Six petabytes for block storage, two petabytes for S3, and one petabyte for CFS. Each of these clusters has about 40 gigabyte SSD journal per uh, HDD. And the goal is to reuse those SSDs as the RocksDB. Uh, we have to start from somewhere. So we chose the uh, clusters that are least sensitive to uh, latency, so the clients won't notice uh, the impact when we do uh, the operations. We follow the, strand, the standard procedure, which is to drain the OSDs related to one SSD using SFOSD out, wait until the data is drained, then we start to zap the SSDs and the HDDs with the save volume commands, and then we recreate the OSDs with the save volume uh, batch command uh, using the same OSD IDs. Uh, the current Luminous uh, implementation doesn't have this one, so we had to backport it uh, from uh, uh, master. Uh, something that we didn't see when we did uh, 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 the operations that uh, is uh, we use uh, the AppMap balancer to balance our clusters, but when we started uh, doing uh, those migrations, the app maps were removed once we ran the CFOS the out command, so our data became imbalanced. You can see that uh, uh, on the next slide. And one also optional and but dangerous procedure is that we wanted to do those migrations as fast as possible. So what we did is that we skipped the drain part. So what uh, we did exactly was uh, just the, the, the second and the, the third uh, step. We zapped immediately the HDDs and SSDs, and we recreate them, and we the, then let the backfill happen. Don't do this <laughs> if, you, if you don't want to go into a danger zone. Uh, these are some numbers from the file store to blue store uh, per performance. Uh, we can see that uh, blue store increases uh, the performance a lot on identical hardware from file store. Uh, the Ratos gateway has a, had a massive metadata performance increase. We use the bucket indices in uh, SSD rocks DB, which is much faster than the one we had before, which was uh, level DB on HDD. Before, we had uh, those metrics that you can see on the top of for put head and delete for the Ratos gateway. And uh, now you can see that we have about 83,000 um, of operations per second, plus minus four. And uh, the others are on uh, the same scale. And the met these metrics before with file store, they were two kilohertz each. And it's, uh, it's a massive performance gain. Also, our CFFS users uh, reported almost uh, double the speed up for read performance. The load average on uh, our file store server were more than the blue store one. So this means that the blue store hosts use much less CPU than the file store ones. We can see here on the, on, on the graph, it's a YAM reposing of all the, the CERN repos, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it uh, took on uh, CFFS uh, more than two hours, and now with the Blue Store ones, it takes 1.2. This uh, is a heat map of our OSD utilization. Uh, what we do is that uh, we run on each host uh, CFOSD DF, and then we sample uh, uh, the data. Uh, from uh, here, you can see on the, the first part is our file store OSD. All of our OSDs rely between uh, uh, 50, 55 to 45 uh, uh, OSD utilization. Um, the blue means that there are less uh, um, data points in that, and the, the red means that th there are more. So you can see that there are more in the area of 50%. And when we start to do the uh, uh, migration to Blue Store. You can see here that our data immediately became balanced. Uh, the variations just spread it out. And uh, on the bottom, you can see the file store, uh, the, the new Blue Store OSDs uh, gaining data over time. Um, the, also, um, we had a problem. You can see on uh, the top right of the, uh, of the graph, um, because we were doing uh, this uh, drain. Uh, and uh, it uh, impacted one of our 
OS this which almost reached uh, five ninety uh, 95% uh, usage, which is a near full one, and we had to take some action. Exercising the app map balancer, one of the long standing issues with Ceph is that at any scale it has been balancing. It used to be normal to have more than 20% variance between OSD utilization. In Luminous, the manager module introduced uh, the, 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 the balancer module, and app map is particularly interesting. What it does is that it maps PGs to underutilized OSDs so we can have. Uh, data balance. The heuristics used by the AppMap balancer have been tuned in recent months. Uh, what you do is that you remove AppMap entries which don't help with the data distribution. You add or remove OSD mappings to existing AppMap entries and support non trivial and crash recent rules. Uh, these are the versions that uh, have all those current heuristics for the uh, MGR, MGR AppMap balancer. Uh, this graph here shows again the OSD utilization after the file store to BlueStore migration. Uh, the first part is uh, when the BlueStore migration uh, finished. These are the, the variants of OSD utilizations that we have. And when we enable the AppMap balancer within two days, we, you can see here that our, all of our OSDs rely on the 50 or 55% uh, OSD utilization. More fun with AppMap. At Chef Day in Berlin, uh, Dan presented the second application of AppMap. AppMap Remapped is a tool to force PGs to be active and clean without data movement. What you do is that uh, sometimes you want to run some commands that do um, changes in the cluster, like changing the, the crash tree that uh, requires uh, data movement. And uh, you don't want to do the recovery because it's a bit heavy uh, for the client I.O. So you uh, app map those PGs back to their previous place so it, everything looks okay. And then you enable the app map balancer it, it itself will remove those app maps um, slowly and uh, then uh, you will have again your cluster balanced. And it will do the operation that you need. Like uh, ch changing tunables to optimal from Jewel or Hammer, uh, removing uh, crash combat weight set, or converting from uh, reweight by utilization to AppMap balancer. The script is available uh, at this link. Uh, use with caution only if needed. If your clusters are underutilized or don't have uh, uh, too much I/O, you can just uh, let uh, the normal recovery happen after you do your uh, operations. S3 authentication with Keystone. The goal is to integrate the Rados Gateway authentication with Keystone. OpenStack has a nice uh, UI that our users use to set their quotas and create accounts. And the problem is that the Rados Gateway S3 authentication with Keystone is very slow because for every client I.O. it has to authenticate uh, through Keystone. And uh, this may cause like a DDoS attack to the Keystone API. Uh, the solution is to uh, synchronize the EC2 credentials with uh, the Ratos Gate one. Through an OpenStack Mistral job, what we do is we synchronize the credentials and the quota of the users to uh, local Ratos Gateway users, and uh, we let uh, the, um, our, our clients use the, the local authentication, which is much faster than the Keystone one. Uh, you can see some details on this uh, following link. Ah, oh, yeah, thanks, Tim. So I'll describe some of the use cases. Um, so most of our OpenStack cloud is designed for just bulk storage of, uh, of typical VM storage. OK, I don't know. I don't want to go into detail. But we, we limit the QoS to the IOPS to 100 or 500 IOPS for these volumes. And like 99.9% .9 of the users that we have are, are totally happy with this. But then, of course, there's always the, the remaining users that are late, have latency sens sensitive applications like databases or like new messaging infrastructures. Um, so we built them a new, a new cell, which has the VMs and the storage all together in the same racks, in the same hosts even. Um, each of these servers has 16 SSDs, where two for the system disk and the ephemeral storage for the, for the VMs, and then 14 Ceph OSDs. Uh, with 128 gigs of RAM, we kind of partition this out. We allocate 64 gigs. We reserve 64 gigs for the VMs, 32 gigs for Ceph, uh, with this OST target memory option. And then we just leave another 32 gigs for kind of the OS and anything else. Um, and then we benchmark this. And uh, with FIO inside VMs mounting this. And we found that um, with our configuration, we can get like 5,000 uh, 4K random write IOPS. 
Um, and then we, we actually were curious if we can use compare replication and erasure coding with the same hardware. And we did, and we got almost the same performance with both. So this is like no brainer. We, we just use erasure coding in this cluster. So this is like a possible new architecture for our cloud to have all flash erasure coded hyperconverged cloud cells. Uh, another interesting thing is this HPC on CephFS. So we're large, mo CERN's mostly a high throughput computing uh, lab. So we have like m multiple hundred thousand CPU cores just doing batch processing. This is not typical HPC workloads. But we have some applications like beam simulations or uh, quantum chromo fluid dynamics, um, which need, which, which need uh, high memory applications also doing mess message passing, and they need like fast POSIX storage. So we've been using CephFS for this because it was uh, what, something we were, we were familiar with already operating. Um, we've been doing this for two years already. And last year, we got into this new IO500 uh, top list, which is, which is a list that's announced each supercomputing. Um, so we're number 21. It was very like, interesting, very fun to get that kind of number into a, into a list like that. Um, so we're the first and we're the only, so we're hoping that some other HPC centers like, contribute to this and we try to create a bit of like, fun competition around that. Uh, and then also, like, because we're more interested in this subject like, for real as well, we've been collaborating with some researchers from the University of Trieste in Italy uh, to tune their climate modeling application with CephFS. Um, and they found, they told us that with our CephFS cluster or with their Lustre cluster, the performance is, is basically comparable. Um, they, don't, they don't see any slowdown with CephFS, and so they're happy. And then moreover, we started testing this new feature, which is Lazy I.O., which, which is a kind of relaxed POSIX standard that Ceph implements. Um, and they can get like three to four times better parallel I.O. with CephFS uh, than, their, than their current performance. So it's looking quite good. Um, this, this study is being wrapped up into a paper at the, at the um, so there's this European Supercomputing Conference called ISC. At this, there's a, wa there's a workshop on, par on parallel storage performance. That's, this, that's where this is going to be published um, quite soon, I hope. Um, then, like, we're also, like, in order to look at this HPC workloads, we're, um, we've, we've done lots of tests in the past comparing, like, how, is important, how important is data locality to the performance question. Like, where is the client compared to the OSDs? Where is the MDS compared to the OSDs? And where is the client compared to the MDS in terms of latency? And like, that, that latency metric we've, we found before and presented in OpenStack Summit in Vancouver last year, that it's like by far the more, it's more important than anything is to make sure that these things are all in the same switch if possible or closer. Um, so currently, we place these, uh, the MDSs just somewhere nearby. Um, but like if we, in our HPCs, we have like multiple switches and routing between them. So if, if the client has to go through a router to get to the traffic, it's, it's, it can be slow. Um, so now we, 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 we try to do like different zones of the, MD, of the, of the CephFS uh, file system. And we have a plan to actually improve this even further so that we would, we would have like a fast HPC scratch area, something like a burst buffer. Um, what we would do with that is we would, we would put some very high endurance, expensive, small capacity flash like directly on the nodes. And then with CephFS, because you can like very quickly create a new file system or create new um, create directories with, uh, with map to, to pools, you, and with crush mapping, you can like locate these pools to specific parts of the cluster. You can create like targeted fast scratch areas for the applications. So what we're, we're, we're basically hooking into Slurm, which is the HPC job scheduler, so that when a job gets scheduled to a part of the cluster, you create a CephFS there, MDS. Uh, OSDs and the directories right there, and then they can do their scratch. They can burn through those, that flash, and then when their job finishes, you, they stage their data out somewhere, and you, and you delete the data. This is all planned to, to try to get a better score in that uh, IO500. Um, we're, also, we're also having fun trying to back up things. We have, a, we have a, another storage system at CERN called CERNBox, which is like a sync and share platform with with accounts for everyone at, at, the, at our lab and all of our users, like 16,000 users, half a billion files, and three petabytes of data so far. And we're trying to back up to S3, to Ceph S3. And we found this cool tool called Restic, which, um, which is really nice. It basically takes a snapshot of a file system by walking the tree. 
backing that up to S3, and then the users can like fuse mount that backup and copy out, recover which files they want one by one, or access the files uh, via fuse. So it's like a very convenient uh, for backing up and recovery. So we like it. But running this kind of backup system for one user is very easy. But when we have 16,000 users to back up, we basically need a backup scheduling system. So we're developing a, a backup scheduling system that coordinates all these backups, um, resolves errors, schedules them. Um, and this is going quite well. I think we're backing up like 300 users now in the current system. Yeah. Yeah. This is the architecture. So the data in CERNBox is stored on a storage system called EOS, which we mount. We back that up to Ceph S3. And then we, and then we have all these backup agents running. Um, yeah, so we can back out oh, 200 users in less than one hour. Um, we're also using uh, object storage in our S3 cluster for some like fun physics analysis demos. If people are staying um, for the KubeCon, on Tuesday, one of our colleagues is going to give uh, a presentation. So basically, in 2012, CERN uh, and some people at CERN got the Nobel Prize for discovering the Higgs boson. Um, what, what some of our colleagues have done is they've like reproduced this whole analysis that took several years of data processing. They've collapsed it down to a, like a subset of the data, and they will like live in real time with a Jupyter notebook, auto scaling Kubernetes, and some object storage. They'll they'll actually redo that whole analysis. So it looks like this. There's like there's like 70 terabytes of simulated data that we have stored. Um, how physics analysis always works is that you simulate what should happen, and then you observe what actually does happen. The observe observation is just taking pictures of what the collisions look like, and then you like to do a subtraction. So it's hard to see, but like this, this like red bump here is actually like a discovery of a Higgs boson because it's not in the simulation. So that's what they do. They simulate a bunch of data, compare it with the real data, and then do it. So I, I won't be here Tuesday, but I hope that their demo goes well. You can see it. Now back to Dale for yeah. some ongoing work. CERN has uh, three active committers to Ceph. Uh, we are mostly fixing, fixing issues found with our operational scope, some uh, uh, requests that we have from clients, some uh, bugs that we find, and they are easy to fix. And uh, we contributed a little bit with the MGR balancer, the Ceph volume, the RBD trust, and the client top. Sometimes we have to do some uh, builds, custom ones with hot fixes. We find some problems. We see on the tracker they are on the uh, newer version, and uh, we just uh, try to apply them to, to our own to fix some uh, uh, issues. Uh, on my master thesis, uh, I'm trying to improve the backfilling process. Um, uh, what back, the backfilling needs to scan all the objects in a, in a PG. It will have to check its object's uh, version, and it will try to match this with, uh, with its replicas. and. Uh, uh, Trying to do that for the uh, whole disk is a really slow operation. What we could do is we could, we could create some data structures that describe the underlying uh, uh, data of the PG, and then we can use those ones to navigate and uh, check which uh, segments of a PG were changed uh, during uh, an OSD which uh, uh, was down. While an OSD is down right now, Chef, what it does is uh, records uh, to a PG log. Every time it uh, writes the uh, I.O. in memory, and uh, when a noise debug uh, comes uh, up from, uh, uh, from when it was uh, down before, it uh, replaces those I.O.s so it can synchronize with the rest of the replicas. The PG log has a hard size limit because it's uh, stored in memory. And uh, when uh, this limit is met, uh, the PG log is dropped, and then what you do is the full backfilling. Uh, full backfilling is needed when a, a, a PG log is too big. It must scan all the objects in the PG, compare this object's uh, version between the PG shards, and uh, it could lead to a really slow recovery time. Uh, one of uh, those solutions are Merkle trees. They were invented by 1979 by Ralph Merkle. They are used by blockchain in Git. The tree is built by splitting the data in, into chunks, hashing those chunks, and then combining those hashes until you get to the top hash. Merkle proofs. Merkle proofs uh, 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 say to us that data could exist in a tree if two hashes are met. So if you hash the same objects, they, it, it means that they should produce the same hash. So what you do instead is you compare the hashes instead of the, all the objects 
uh, in uh, the on the disk. Uh, this is a sample of a Merkle tree that could be in, uh, in Ceph. Uh, the bottom row uh, that uh, is from uh, 0 to 7 is uh, uh, range, and uh, we cut it into eight chunks. So in those chunks, uh, uh, there could be uh, PG objects uh, along with uh, their versions. And uh, what we could do is that we hash all those objects and versions, and then we combine them until we reach the top hash. So two replicas, if we want to know if they are different or not, we could try by uh, checking the top hash and going through their children. Uh, in uh, this particular example, we could see that uh, the resulting top hash of uh, two different trees is uh, different. That's why it's marked with red, the ones that are the same are green. And as we go down the tree, we found out that only three eighths of an actual PG has to be recovered instead. So this could save uh, uh, a lot of time in some cases. With this fixture, we can quickly discover which ranges uh, uh, we can skip uh, during backfilling and make it faster. The trees consume uh, constant memory because it's just the tree. It, it, it doesn't add anything else, like the PG log, which has to uh, increment every time an I.O. happens. And uh, currently, it's a developing proof of concept. I have done the implementation. The skip range functionality is done. Uh, now we have to f I have to find out how to do the persistence and the update in a uh, uh, way that it's performant. it doesn't impact the performance, because on every I.O., the, uh, the tree has to be updated. It will take a long of time until uh, it hits uh, production. So stay tuned. Thanks, Theo. That's the end of the talk, but I mean, so it's just another talk that we've given in the long series of Ceph talks. Um, the usage at CERN continues to grow. It's like now well-established, reliable backstop for our cloud and our HPC activities. It's kind of becoming a little bit boring. It's so reliable and uh, well-established. We have to shake things up a little bit, I think. Um, like many others, I want to thank the, the, the awesome Ceph community, which are so friendly, knowledgeable peers that we learn a lot from, and everyone's constructive working together. It's really great. And we know that it's like super important to maintain a good community karma, so I hope that you guys also uh, try to do that. And we have a save the date here, because we're planning an event this fall in September um, at CERN to host a, a Ceph day, where we want to focus on research or academic or nonprofit ac uh, applications of Ceph. Um, it'll be like one day, or we might change the date to September 17th. We have to just get the exact room booking down, so keep, keep an eye on the, on the mailing list for the final announcement. It's, we're trying to coordinate it very close to an event, uh, which is the 14th and 15th of September, which is CERN Open Days, which is CERN will open its doors to the public, and you can come and visit all of the different sites, get di tours of things that are normally closed. Um, so yeah, I, that's why we're trying to do this at the same time. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions? Yeah, is there, is there a microphone? Sure. Yeah. We also have very few stickers at the front that people can come grab after. Yeah. He, he was the first one. <laughs> Hi. Um, your um, attempt to get the fastest file system and give Lustra a run. Um, are you using erosion encoding on that? And if so, what sort of profile are you using? No, that's a, that's a 2x replica all flash cluster. OK, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, do you use multiple crush routes in your Ceph clusters, or do you separate them in separate clusters? We, we have both. OK. Our, our large block storage cluster has two crush routes, um, like one in one room with uh, UPS battery power and one crush route in a room with a diesel generator power, so it's two different qualities of service. Uh -huh. And we, we used to, in fact, put the first two replicas in the diesel room and the third replica in the main room, but because of capacity reasons, we moved that third replica back to, um, back to the diesel room. Yep. Thank you. Uh, just a quick, <clears throat> just a quick question about the um, S3 and Keystone integration. Yeah. I read your po post, but I've seen there was some patches from BBC. Um, they didn't make it into Mimic, I think. They're, I'm not, I'm not sure about this. Uh, are you aware of them? And which do, solution do you do you think is 
better for production use if we are running Mimic? Um, I mean, we're using this in production. Uh, I heard that there was some possible caching thing going in exactly, for Keystone. Yes. But yeah, so we did hear about that. So at the OpenStack Summit, um, our colleague Jose presented this. He did that work for that, and he, he pointed us out. So yeah, as soon as there's some like proper solution for this, we will stop synchronizing <laughs> the keys okay. into our okay. Rattles gateway. Okay. But, but for now, it's the only option. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks.